Hey everybody, sorry I couldn't be there in person today. Uh, I had some other things going on, but I still wanted to share with you my presentation on bees. And this talk is called How to Be a Hero for Bees. And then first of all, we, people are always wondering why do we care about bees? What's kind of the deal with that? Well, they do provide a third of all the food that we eat. Uh, one out of every three bites of food you put in your mouth is made possible by some sort of pollinator. And then native bees are the most efficient pollinators. They're, they're way more efficient than a honeybee. So a lot of wildlife too depends on bees because obviously their food is pollinated by a pollinator of some sort, just as ours is. And the saying is, as go the pollinators, so goes the world, which is sort of kind of a gloom and doom thing, but it's not all bad. But there are some threats to bees. Obviously, there's habitat loss. The more people there are, the less room for wildlife there is. Uh, the more monoculture agriculture that we have, obviously, because somebody needs to feed everyone in the world, <laughs> the, the less room there is for bees. And also, with that comes diseases and pathogens and, and things that are just obviously harmful for bees. Climate change, too, is a thing uh, that affects everything, obviously, right? We all know that it affects the phenology of things. Um, it affects when flowers bloom versus when bees come out and all those sorts. Pesticides, too, are a big thing, obviously. Um, the neonicotinoids that you may have been hearing a little bit more about now uh, in the news and everything, a lot of times the seeds of, of corn and soybean and all these things are treated with pesticides before they're even planted. Oddly, research has found that that does not do a whole lot of good for farmers, but that's they think it does, so they keep doing it. One of the things we can do is we can create habitat for bees. And when people think of bees, a lot of times they think of honey and big beehives and those sorts of things. But there are different kinds of bees. Most, Almost all of the bee species that are native to Wisconsin will either be in the ground, they're ground nesting bees, or they will be what they call cavity nesting bees. And we'll get to that in a minute. Um, creating, so for creating habitat, if we leave bare ground spaces, as you can see in the picture there, that gives a, a place for bees to, to burrow into that are, are the ground nesting type. And there's been times, like a place in my yard, the last house I had up north, where I knew there was ground nesting bees, and I would just kind of cover that area with something so I wasn't running over with the lawnmower or, or that kind of thing, just like a, a cage on top of it. Leave the leaves. I'm sure we've all heard of this. Um, all, all of that stuff, all that duff litter leaves and, and all of the debris that's in the yard, that gives a place for overwintering for a lot of bees. They'll go underneath there and they'll stay all winter long. and It keeps them, keeps them insulated, keeps them warm, uh, protects them from the elements. So if you leave those leaves and then once they, once they you know, come out in the springtime, you can kind of, kind of get all that stuff out of the way. Stems and snags. This is what I was talking about, about cavity nesting bees. Um, I have some bergamot that I planted, and what I'll do is I'll leave a lot of those stems for the whole winter. Some of them that I cut back, I'll just stick right back behind the plant, right up next to my house, because that's where my garden is. But all of those places give bees place to go nest. And your cavity-dwelling bees, what they'll do is they'll go down in there, they'll drop an egg in there, they'll put enough food in there for that, for that egg to... Larva, the for larva to use once the egg hatches, and then they'll, they'll make these little cavities all the way up. So um, they they need a lot of that standing kind of stems and whatnot. And then we have bee houses. Bee houses. This is what a bee house looks like. Um, they're kind of falling out of favor a little bit more than they were in the past because they've found that people don't aren't taking care of them maybe like they should. So. We have to keep them clean. You have to, you know, make make sure that there's no diseases or anything going on in those. So be be aware of that. They're not the worst thing in the world. Just be aware that there there could be some problems if you don't keep them clean. And now when we think about food for bees, one of the things we want to think about is early blooms. Like especially this year because this year is so weird. You want to make sure that there's things out there that are already blooming. Things like pussy willows and and those sorts of native things. Berries and fruits, um, those provide benefits for birds, so any of that kind of stuff that you know comes out early, not only are you helping the pollinators, but you're helping the birds. Um, dogwood, red bug, uh, red bud, I'm sorry, maple, and serviceberry, those are four that, that grow well here that you might want to try in your yard. 
And then I always say this when in doubt, plant an oak. I think you guys have heard me say this before. There are over 100 species of wildlife that can utilize an oak tree. And the thing is, an oak doesn't have to be huge. You can you can have what they call an oak shrub. Basically, what you do is you go ahead and you plant your oak. You get let it get about three feet tall. You cut off the top. And then you just keep keep cutting it and trimming it. And it will continue to grow. And it will continue to, to be three feet tall as long as you as long as you keep it at that that height so yeah but oak trees um if anybody's read doug tallamy's book uh the good oak i believe it's called they they provide all kinds of beneficial services so when in doubt plant an oak and then when you're thinking perennials always think native plants first obviously uh native plants even even with climate change native plants and native bees their phenology will stay closer and Phenology, just in, for those that don't know, is just the um, basically the study of when things happen, like when fish spawn and when trees bud and all these things that happen together, because they're all native plants, have all, have evolved to happen at the time that, say, the bees need them or the birds need them or those sorts of things. So that's something to keep in mind. And like I said, even as climate changes, you have the best odds of your native plants evolving with your native bees. And I, again, I said, think, think of early season blooms, bright colors, reds, yellows, purples, blues, all the colors that we like, I guess, is, is the easy way to put it. If you like the colors, then bees are going to like the colors. And then when you're out in your garden, people say, oh, no, I've got all kinds of bees in my garden and I can't go out there. Try to, to keep them away. You can wear some lighter colors, wear like a white or pastel or, or that sort of stuff that won't attract them. A bee lawn. I think I've talked about bee lawns before as well. I hope everyone's heard of No Mow May, and that is allowing basically all of your, even Creeping Charlie, I have it in my yard, but it's an early bloom, so I don't I don't try to get rid of it. Uh, that and dandelions and those sorts of things. Not mowing all that stuff down in May gives the bird some, or birds, gives the bees some kind of food to eat. The, the stuff that they need. But a bee lawn, I, I like to say that that turns no mow may into no mow anyway. And you can get, at any garden store, you can get seeds for a bee lawn. What it is, it doesn't get more than six inches high. You can use it just like a regular lawn. You can play frisbee on it. You can do whatever it is that your family does in your yard. But it doesn't require a lot of mowing. Another thing that's nice is in the middle of the summertime, it doesn't require a lot of water either. So when everybody else is turf lawn, their Kentucky bluegrass is turning brown, your bee lawn's still going to look beautiful. And you don't have to start big. You don't have to say, I'm going to do my whole three-acre yard or whatever the case may be. You can start small. Start in the corner of your yard that, that doesn't get a lot of traffic and just see if it's something that's going to work for you. And overseeding can be an issue with a bee lawn, so, tr so try to just follow the, the package directions. Um, once you try a little spot, if it doesn't look as, as good as you want to, go ahead and add more you know, seed in, in your next spot. But be and then renovation. What does that mean? Well, think of it as a renovation for your, for your lawn. Um, think of it as, as making things a little better and, and just providing all of that, that habitat and the stuff that the birds need and the bees need and, and other wildlife as well. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the different kinds of bees. Normally when people think of bees, like I said, they think honeybees. Honeybees are agriculture, right? They people have the big hives and they they bring them, you know, all over the country and pollinate certain areas. Yes, there's colony collapse in honeybees, and yes, that's a problem, but that's not a conservation problem. That's an agriculture problem. If that makes sense. They're they're basically livestock, like just like cows or anything else. Um. So bumblebees. Bumblebees are native. We do have some native bumblebees. One of those, as you can see in the picture here, is the rusty patched bumblebee. That one is actually um, an endangered species. It has been seen. Uh, a friend of mine on Squash Lake reported one, so that was kind of cool. Then we have the yellow-banded bumblebee, as you can see, has the yellow bands on it. <laughs> None of these names are difficult. Tricolored bumblebee is black, orange, and yellow. And then the half black bumblebee, shocker, I know, right? It's half black. Like, like I said, none of these these common names are, are really too difficult. Um, now, honey honeybees and bumblebees are not solitary bees. They, they have a hive. The rest of these bees are solitary. That means that they they 
these are the kind that aren't going to sting you. You find one and it might even land right on you, but it's not going to hurt you. It really has nothing to protect. It just has itself. It's kind of like just, hey, I'm out here being a bee, doing bee stuff. And it's not going to bother you very much. Mason bee is one of those. These guys are really, really small. Um, the leaf cutter bee, that one gets its name, obviously, because it tears up leaves. And that's what it uses to, to pack its little compartments. Remember when I talked about in being in the in the stock of like a bergamot or something like that? That's what it uses. It, it tears up leaves to do that kind of stuff. Minor bees, this is probably going to be a shock, but they, they dig. <laughs> they're, they're a ground nesting bee. Uh, and that's why that's how they got their name, because somebody thought it looked like a little miner going into a, a coal mine or something. Carpenter bees, these these are kind of difficult to see that they're in the bee family exactly, because as you can see, that doesn't look like a like what we would normally call a normal bee. Now a lot of you guys may have these already. These are my bee sources for you. Um, so I would recommend, one of the big ones on here that I would recommend is Plant, Pat Goggin's Guide to Native Plants. I don't know how many of you know Pat Goggin. He retired recently. Um, he was with Wisconsin Lakes, or uh, UW Extension. He worked in the Rhinelander office for quite a while. Um, but yeah, he, and then I also have Doug Tallamy's Good, Good Oak, that book on there. But Pat is super, super knowledgeable. If you want to know anything about any sort of uh, native plant, if he doesn't know, his wife Keita does. She she works at uh, Land and Water here in, Vi in Vilas County. So anyway, I appreciate you guys, and I'm sorry that I couldn't be there again. Um, I'm stuck at a uh, Land and Water conference in Stevens Point, and there was no way I was going to get back to Manaqua in time to do the or Woodruff in time to do this. So I appreciate you all of your time, and good luck gardening.